Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of um, Imperial as One's Belonging series, where we explore the experiences of individuals from different Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. And you know what? Every week I say this, and we've been away a few weeks, but we're back now. And um, we've got Professor Richard Reddick, Reddick from, um, from the University of Texas. And I'm really, really impressed. I'm, I'm just so excited about having this conversation with him today. Um, Richard, serendipity brought us together, but I know that there's going to be great things which have come or which will come from this. So Richard, I'm gonna, not going to steal your thunder, but I'm going to just say a really big thank you for um, coming in and having a, this discussion with us this um, afternoon. All right, so Richard, we're going to start with my usual question, which is, tell us about, as you were growing up, what was it that gave you your initial sense of identity, your sense of belonging, as you were kind of like in your formative years great well wayne it's great to be here uh such a uh, a joy to be uh, in company with you and your colleagues again um and you know something you should know about me um is that i actually spent about 10 years of my childhood living in the uk my dad was mm -hmm. in the air force mm -hmm. and so i lived in oxfordshire i lived in suffolk and so i think actually growing up in britain in the 1970s 1980s mm -hmm. was a pretty strong way to sort of orient myself culturally and, and inspirationally so i come from a family well i'm the first in my family to go to college you know yeah. first generation college student my mother's jamaican Mm -hmm. Immigrated to, to England in the United States, married my dad, mm -hmm. and my dad is from North Carolina. And wow. they both realized that they had done a lot in their lives, but the thing they had not had a chance to do was sort of explore education at a higher level. Right. Um, those of you from West Indian extraction know how it works. You know, the standards are very high. <laughs> uh, so you got to bring it. So I, I knew from very early on, I showed some academic you know, talent, and they were like, well, this is the thing you're going to do, and you're going to do this well. I'll also credit actually growing up in the UK and watching, you know, television for schools. I mean, um, in the States, if you turn TV on in the mornings, you'll see cartoons and, you know, talk shows. But in the 1970s, 1980s, you would see open university programs, you would see uh, children's programming. And I would apparently, my mom said I would go up to her and talk and say, I saw pneumatic tires being demonstrated, and I would talk to her about how tires worked at the age of four um so i, I think those things were and, and also just coming it, culturally i think um it was a time of the national front still had its presence um right. white supremacy was definitely a, a vibe and and i think there was a sort of response that culturally we were you know, capable we were um able to do great things i'm not gonna deny the the importance of something like Bob Marley appearing in the 1970s, yeah. being Jamaican, having family connections to his family, you know, just really was something about Black pride, Black excellence. And, and of course, um, when I think about growing up in the late 70s, early 80s, just the cultural movement for like two-tone and ska, and all of a sudden you had this racial unity uh, sort of thing coming through the popular culture mm -hmm. with a backdrop of Thatcherism. Yeah. So, yeah. All those things. And then I come to the States and, you know, I had had this idolized version of the American experience because I had been living as an American overseas and America is great and wonderful things are happening. Mm -hmm. And I came to Austin, Texas, which is the city with the greatest socioeconomic disparities in the nation. So right. I went to I went to schools in the city that were incredibly under resourced and then incredibly lacking in all kinds of things needed to have an excellent education. But I would visit schools. 10 miles away that had a plethora of resources. Yeah. So that really, I mean, I always say I was sort of wired to do inequity work because I experienced it personally. Yeah. And I had the lens to sort of filter and say, this is not normal. Like if you grew up in that environment and you thought that's all there was, you might think that was sufficient. But I had gone to some of the best schools in the American school system, which is the Department of Defense Education Activity Schools. Right. Um, so I knew what excellent schools looked like and I wasn't intending those. And then I had a chance to see the excellent schools in the city, wasn't intending those either. So it was, I mean, Wayne, for me, it was baked in. It was something that started very early. And then I guess I stumbled upon some courses in, at university where it's like, oh, you mean you can study this? You know, you can 
look at this and get data and, and, and make sense of this. So that's really where it started. It started from a very young age, I would say. So I just want to backtrack slightly, just a little bit, in terms of looking at the differences, because you've experienced both the British education system and the American education system at a critical point in your life. So if you moved there when you were about 10, 11-ish, um, so you were, so the transition, um, how was that transition for you? What, what was the disparities or what was it that you noticed and do you think that that was influential in where you wanted to go in the future? I, I think it was. And, and to be clear, the Department of Defense Education Activity Schools are American schools in the American system. However, we did have host nation classes. And I do think there was an influence on the British system. And we had many right. teachers who were educated in British schools. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there were a couple of things. I mean, I think the focus on culture and the arts was much higher. Mm -hmm. um in, in department of defense schools so i was mm -hmm. a group aware of sort of recent british history mm -hmm. uh, you know similarly maybe more glamorized and maybe less about racism but more about sort of the triumph of you know world war ii those kinds of things like that but nevertheless a lot about the cultural context i was living in yeah um i, I think also um standards Mm -hmm. And when I talk about those schools, Department of Defense schools are usually the schools that are attended by military personnel's dependents yeah. um, and some civilians who work in the military establishment. So everybody at that school had a mother, a father, a guardian who was a military employee and had a chain of command. Yeah. And I always say this, if you were naughty in school, you acted up and, if, and they couldn't take care of you, the next step was to call your parents' commander and say, wow. we've got a problem with your child. Wow. <laughs> As you can imagine, that would <laughs> circumvent pretty much any problem of any uh, significance. And I'll, I'll give an example about this. So Shaquille O'Neal, um, the basketball player whom you yeah. all know, um, was an army brat. He was, his dad was stationed in, in Germany. Right. And he decided, I think in middle school, he didn't want to be in Germany. So he decided I'm gonna be bad and get thrown out of school. So he did some bad things and they called his dad from work to deal with it. And as he puts it, that problem was solved very quickly. <laughs> he wasn't going to the States. Uh, he was going to finish up his schooling in, in, in Germany. And of course, the rest is history. Yeah. So uh, I, I think the fact that those schools had such tight community connections yeah. and such uh, intense parental involvement out of necessity. Yeah. Um, we, many of us lived in the same communities. In, in my case, I lived, we call in the economy, which means I lived in a village called Stan Lake in Oxfordshire. Right. So I didn't live anywhere near other Americans, but that right. was our cultural connection. Like, you know, if I wanted to see people and talk about back to the future or, you yeah. know, whatever was happening in America that wasn't happening in Britain at the time, we would have that happening there. I think also the fact that, you know, we had a chance to sort of immerse ourselves in the culture and it was very easy to do so because of the common language. So, mm. you know, allegedly we share a language. And sometimes I question that calculus, <laughs> but we do. And so it's very easy to wander and exist in, you know, uh, an English village, uh, immerse yourself in a group of English friends. And all of us had those sort of cross-cultural experiences. Mm -hmm. So lots of diversity, I think, Wayne. And I think what happened for me when I came to America, I realized segregation is such a powerful tool. And I talk about residential segregation. Yes. So in America, especially in a place like Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. we had de jure, you know, we had legal um, setups that made it impossible for blacks and whites and Latinos and Asians to live in proximity to each other. Yeah. So when you start off with the idea, you don't live close to people who have the same, who have different racial backgrounds or socioeconomic backgrounds. And then you add on the layer of the fact that um, our schools are neighborhood schools. Generally, schooling in the United States is based on locality. So you go to right. local schools. There was a movement in the 70s at the time of uh, integration where my mentor, Charles V. Willie, was very involved in desegregation plans across the country where you bust kids from yeah. distant parts of the city to get racial integration. Yeah. And I went to school during that time, actually. So right. I always tell people I was in schools in Austin, Texas, at the height of the integration movement, which is like the late eighties. Yeah. But, you know, if not for that, you would go to school with people very much like you racially, culturally, socioeconomically. And that doesn't, doesn't do much to expand your view of the world. And right. yeah. you can say it's protective in some ways because you, you seem to have, you know, 
commonality and continuity with, with your colleagues. And it's also the issue of what are your teachers' expectations of you? If yeah. your teachers are not from your community and they have a negative deficit orientation about your community, Mm -hmm. then they may not necessarily push you as far. I was lucky yeah. to go to school in a part of the city where uh, Latino and Latina uh, teachers were pretty prevalent from the community. Um, the white teachers in the community invested. You wouldn't teach in my community unless you really cared about that community. And so I had this really interesting sort of outlying experience where, you know, high stake, I mean, high expectations, high support, cultural understanding, but still lacked resources. Despite that, I was able to, you know, succeed in, in secondary school, partly because of the boost I had, I think, when I was in the UK at those schools, but also because I had a very strong sense of self. I never felt that I couldn't achieve. And I hear from students all the time when they are in a minority in a, in a schooling system that is predominantly white, that's often a part of the experience. Like, do I belong here? Yeah. The, the microaggressions, the micro invalidations that take place, sometimes you get the sense that this is not really a space for you. You hear, you're here despite all of the things that happened. And then that does a lot to, I always remind people, you know, just the energy of sort of processing and figuring what a microaggression is, or is it just people being rude to you or whatever it is, that's time away from other things, you know? And I think about the work uh, of Claude Steele. Yeah. He talks about sort of imposter, I mean, stereotype threat and how that just takes things out of, out of us. And, and, you know, there's a low grade fever you have throughout your schooling experience. And then you realize, well, I, I'm not devoting my 100% energy to this because I'm thinking about how I'm being perceived. Yeah, I'm thinking about if that person said something to me rude. Was that because they don't like me? Is it because my identity? You know, what is it? How much of that is taking us away from being able to apply ourselves in the highest level? Yeah. <laughs> talking to you it's like i'm i'm hearing your voice in my head it's just with with regards to that then so uh, clearly from those early experiences your passion for teaching for understanding for that sense of identity belonging was ingrained so what you you mentioned about the fact that there was kind of like segregated communities and the integration plans and things like that when you then went off to university okay what was the dynamic then within the academic university setting and what was the motivation for you to actually go to university being the first in family to go etc and what was you, you know what I mean yeah yeah well as I said, it was an expectation. It was not even something that was considered. It's like, you know, we got to this point, mm -hmm. you take it to the next level. And, and it was a positive kind of, uh, okay. I guess, pressure. You know, it was mm -hmm. not like withering. Um, my, my parents knew that I was academically talented and they mm -hmm. were like, well, obviously you're gonna go to university, right? And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. sure. How do you do that? And mm -hmm. truly had no idea how to make it happen. And in fact, I remember um, my dad had a colleague at work who whose mm -hmm. son did, planning for college and, and this is you know in, the, in America much like in the UK our mm -hmm. system for funding higher education changed drastically in the 1980s 1990s so when I went to university it was very affordable comparatively speaking mm -hmm. um, what I tell students now is that university tuition at the University of Texas approximates you know between seven thousand nine thousand dollars a semester for tuition today yeah. When I was in school in nineteen late nineteen eighties nineteen nineties, the cost was actually about five to seven hundred dollars a semester. So a tenfold increase, mm. you know, in all this time. So you know, literally, we were like, well, you know, there's scholarships, aren't there? Aren't there scholarships available? And they're like, well, maybe you got a scholarship, but honestly, you know, it's cost us much. My parents didn't have that kind of money, so I was like, well, I'll work. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll work and make the money, make that money in two weekends, and then I'll live at home and I'll go, right? That'll mm -hmm. make sense. There's a university in the town we live in, you know, no yeah. problem. Yeah. Um, and um, this is a great story, actually. Um, I was I was in school one day, and in America, we have, um, we don't have A-levels and O-levels, but we do have sort of a college uh, access test called the SAT, yeah. uh, an ACT, and then there's something called the PSAT, which is something you take previous to the SAT. And I didn't know this, but this test in particular is what is used by a number of uh, talent search organizations. And what we call National Merit Scholars are derived from this test. Yeah. Did not know this. My school offered a free test. 
I figured it was a practice SAT, P-S-A-T, practice SAT. So I signed up for it. And I just happened to be in a room with a, a, a girl I was interested in. And I just got thrown out of that test. And, you know, I was got I was warned like three times, like, if you don't shut up, you're throwing out, the, you're going out this test. I'm like, I don't care. But I finished the test. Turns out I did really well in that test. And I started getting a lot of mail from universities uh, about their programs and places like Ohio and places like Georgia. And I'm like, that's really far. I don't know where I want to go there. Texas is a massive state. So my kind of mindset was like, well, I will go to school in Texas, obviously, right? Yeah. Um, and every so often I get something from like uh, a Princeton or something like that. And I'm like, wow, that's, I've heard of that place, but you know, that's, that's probably for other people. Yeah. So I, I, I was more or less adrift and um i got a call in school one day to come to the front office and usually i admit something not so good had happened and um the secretary told me um there's a man library to meet with you from the university of texas do not act up just talk to the man and, and behave yourself <laughs> right right so i go in there and i talk to this gentleman he's african-american gentleman yeah. um from the university of texas which first of all i was like oh okay they have black people who work there this is a new thing and, you know, he's asked me about my interest and what I'm doing and, you know, my performance on this test. And, you know, he's like, well, would you be interested in attending the University of Texas? I'm like, duh. Yeah, sure. Of course. You know, well, how's that happen? He's like, well, you know, I actually have the authority to issue scholarships and I'd like to issue you, we call it Texas Achievement Honors Award, which is a five-year scholarship. Wow. Um, and... So all of my problems and concerns my parents had had, because I was thinking about this in some ways. I'm like, I don't want to give my parents a problem, yeah. you know, so I'm going to figure out how to make this happen some way. And so that day I was given this five-year scholarship. I hadn't even applied to the university. So I had to do that right afterwards. <laughs> uh, uh, and then um, I was also encouraged by one of my teachers to apply for an honors program. Right. And I blithely refused that. I'm like, look, I worked hard in high school and I'm going to go to college and do the college stuff and get C's and graduate because nobody cares what you do after college, right? So, and, and she basically said to me, if you don't apply for this program, you could be in danger of not passing your senior level class you need to pass to graduate. And I'm like, that's gangster. Like she got me. So <laughs> reluctantly, I applied to this program, but I got into it. I mean, after, you know, getting over the initial insult of being, you know, 17 and not being once told what to do. I, I got over it and actually did the application, enjoyed it. I get into the program. And that program, which is called the Plan 2 Honors Program, is mm -hmm. the one of the premier public um, honors programs in the country. Right. Uh, and I got into that program purely by chance because I didn't know anything about it. I had a teacher who knew about it and she directed me to do this program. And yesterday I was with the students in that program. Yeah. And they are truly getting a concierge educational experience because they're getting the best faculty they're getting the best opportunities and i was in that milieu yes. so you know for me i mean that was the positive side the negative side of course was being in a racialized space that was clearly quite white valued whiteness and at least questioned the validity of black intellect because yes. You, you probably had the same experiences where, you know, well, how did you get here? What were your test scores like? Yeah. Guess what? My test scores are really good. Yes. So, yeah. but even then just being asked that question made me think, well, yeah, how did I get into here? And I actually ran into academic difficulty in my, my first year and actually ended up on a probationary status for a short period of time. And that really shook my confidence. You know, can I actually do this? Is this not something that I should be looking into? Should I take an easier course? You know, all those different things kind of came to mind. Uh, but luckily, I had people in the program who told me, you know what, it's not that uncommon to have people go on probation. It happens a lot. We don't talk about it, but it does happen. Yeah. And I also realized, you know, in American universities, the co-curricular things you do, the clubs, the organizations you're a part of, you know, those are also launching points for building networks and so forth. I became that person. I became very involved in issues related to, you know, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, sort of uplifting and supporting black students and minority students in general. And I did that work. I got involved in a number of organizations. I actually ended up working in the Office of Dean of Students. Actually, the building right behind me, I used to work there as a student pretty much all my, 
my time there. And, and so I just became very embedded into the university experience. And I kind of said to myself, you know, if they gave out grades based on being involved, I would get all A's. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, how does one do that in the next level? And I worked with a mentor and it was Brenda Burt. And she was like a mother for me, um, yeah. literally a black woman on the campus, looking out for me, working with her for many years. And, you know, basically mothering me and telling me, you know, you should be doing these things, you shouldn't be doing those things, you know, uh, in the way that a black mother would do it, you know, very directly, you know, <laughs> as they say, no, no. chill. Right? Yeah. Like, no, that is not the way you're going to do things, you know, or yes, that's how you do it, right? <laughs> and actually, when I think about it, I actually grew up in a group of black women who were, you know, staff members at the university, who were all sort of you know, they knew who I was, they looked out for me, and I started taking courses with people like Dr. George Wright, you know, I had an immersion in that experience. And then that really sort of gave me the confidence. And immediately after university, I started taking, I took courses at the university based on, you know, sociology and other spaces. And I was like, what's the space I want to work in? And it was education, right? Yeah. My education experience had been quite varied and quite interesting. And I thought I had a rapport working with young people. And I, I thought, you know, maybe I'll work on the on the you know, secondary level. So I thought being a teacher would be the way I wanted to do it. So I did a program called Teach for America in the early 1990s, mm -hmm. just had started. It's become very prestigious and very well known. But back then it was kind of a new thing. Yeah. And I taught in inner city Houston, Texas. And I taught elementary school, 10 year olds. And I was like, I want to teach high school. That's my group. And they're like, no, you're teaching 10 year olds. Uh, and it was a very tough job. And Wayne, for me, having the hardest job I ever had in my life at 22 was a blessing because it was just taxing in every way and challenging in every way. But I loved teaching the kids. I loved the community I was working in. Yeah. Everything else was just just so, so hard. And, um, you know, I realized after two years doing that, that my my interest in working in education was still there, but it was not at that level and not working in a public schooling system in America where there's just so much pressure on raising test scores and not a whole lot of focus on the whole student, I felt. Right, okay. So, you know, that grad school, and next thing you know, here I am. <laughs> I, just going back, because I reson it resonates with me working in with younger children, because oftentimes when we see professors of in education, in higher education, we don't recognize, or for many, it's just higher education that they've experienced. They haven't experienced the full gambit, but you have, right? So yeah. you, you mentioned about it was a tough time. One not not necessarily with the children, but with the bureaucracy around it, it was, exactly. was preventing you from actually fulfilling the potential of the students. So yeah. what was it that gave you that, that trigger then to say, I'm going to go back and study and I want to get into either, did you want to go into higher education or was it just further education that you were specifically interested in? And how was it that you wanted to develop that? Definitely higher education, because I had done that work. I had worked as a, we call them resident advisors, which means right. I lived in the building with students and I was an orientation advisor, welcoming students to campus. Mm -hmm. You know, the first year student coming to the university, that was kind of the group I knew really well. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, maybe I should work with that group. But people had told me, well, if you want to work at a university, you have to get another degree, a master's degree. And I'm like, oh no, I'm like, I just got through that. I'm like, you know, and, and, and so finally, um, when I was working in Houston, uh, I was on a some kind of advisory panel to the superintendent who actually ended up being uh, Dr. Rod Page, who ended up being the Secretary of Education under George W. Bush. So all the sort of no child left behind, uh, yeah. that was starting when I was teaching. So it's probably why I didn't want to teach anymore, because it was just very draining yeah. to be a new educator and deal with all of those kinds of test, 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 test yeah. kind of things. Yeah. But nevertheless, I met um, an intern there, and this woman was incredible. She was organized. She knew policy. And I just said to her one day, I said, how do I be like you? What, what have you done in your life to, to get to the level? She says, well, I'm, you know, I'm enrolled as a doctoral student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Harvard. Ooh, that's mm, you know, very <laughs> fancy. you know." And she's like, well, it, you know, yeah, it's fancy. But she said, it's actually not like that. And you actually find and lots of people there. And, you know, you might want to look into you know, getting a degree there too. And I'm like, okay, you know, 
this is 1995. And, yeah. and so there is no internet to speak of. It exists, but nobody has a website. So you have to actually order a prospectus, you know, a view book. Yeah. And I said to myself, okay, this is the big, the big H, Harvard, you know, everybody's, ooh, so, so you know, so let me look at this thing. And I'll, I, I was kind of defiant. And I said, look, there's probably no black people there. There's probably no brown people there. So if I don't see people like that, I'm not even going to buy. This is a protective thing. Yeah, I won't apply. And I won't be rejected if I don't meet my standard. I open the book, and there are black people in the book. <laughs> Roland Hentz is the director of admissions, a black man. A couple pages later, there's a guy named Charles V. Willie. He's the Charles William Elliott Professor of Education. That sounds important. Uh, there's all these other, you know, uh, Marcelo Suarez Orozco. There's all these different, you know, names. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I was a little wrong about this. Maybe they are, mm -hmm. in fact, people. Uh, mm -hmm. And I cast my lot. I wrote an application and, you know, put in my dollars and mailed it off and kind of forgot about it for a little bit. And it just turns out there was a person a year ahead of me um, in the Teach for America program who went to Harvard and he reached out to me and said, you know, and hearing him talk about it made it kind of feel real to me. I'm like, okay, I knew this guy and he's a smart guy, but he's not like, you know, a genius with brains coming out of his ears. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a smart, normal guy. I could maybe I have a chance. Yeah. And, you know, in America, the packets, it's, it's, it's well known that when you get a thick packet, it's good news. When you get a thin packet, it's, it's bad news. So I got a thick packet, open it up, you're admitted, you know, huge costs. I didn't look at that. I'm like, I'll worry about it later. Yeah. But then I have to move from Houston to, <laughs> to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I'm broke. I was a teacher. I don't have any money. So I cobbled together some way of getting up there. And we, my, my fiance, now my wife, moved into a tiny little flat right across from Harvard Yard. And that was my experience. And um, I mean, Wayne, the experience was incredible. At this point, there wasn't a higher education focus at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, but there were professors doing that work. So Charles Willie, who I mentioned, was yeah. doing that work. Yeah. Uh, Judy McLaughlin was doing that work. I took courses with them. I had an internship at MIT, working in the Student Affairs Division there. I mean, I was seeing everything I'd ever studied um, at MIT at the time. They had a huge problem with alcohol behaviors at university, students getting alcohol poisoning and getting, and dying. That happened a lot. Um, and it was just I was seeing everything in higher education at once. I was interested in things like ethnic theme housing, like a, an actual floor of a residential building that was de devoted to students of color. Uh, BAME students, whatever it was, right? Um, so those are the kind of things I got involved in. I also had a mentor named Frank Tewitt. He was a graduate student a couple of years ahead of me. And I kind of followed him because I realized this guy knew things that were going on. So we worked at MIT on diversity equity issues. You know, um, engineers sometimes are not the most receptive group to diversity and equity. <laughs> They're like, well, you know, there's a logical flow to this. This is a logical, therefore it's not an issue. And so we dealt with a lot of those kinds of challenges. But I really made some great networks, but it was only a year long program. So just as I was kind of getting the flow and hang of things, it was over. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I really enjoyed this, but I was exhausted. I mean, a year long master's program is intense. Yeah. And, I, I, and I left and I worked in California at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and worked at Emory University in Atlanta. And about that time when I went to Emory, I got a, a call from the Harvard Graduate School of Education office. And they're like, you know, you're in Atlanta. We do recruiting down there all the time for uh, new students. Could you come to a panel and talk about your experience? And I'm like, oh, that's very nice. You know, they remember me. So I went there and sat in this panel and they asked me my experience. And I said, I got involved in everything on campus. I worked at MIT and had great professors. But this one professor, Charles Willie, who actually went to Morehouse. So he's an Atlanta guy. He spent time in Atlanta. And I started talking about him. Everybody kind of turned and says, Dr. Willie, you know, we had this conversation about this one professor yeah. that we all had had. And it, they, people went to school 10 years ago, 20 years ago, two years ago, all talk about Dr. Willie. That was kind of like a reminder. And we had actually, Dr. Willie was old school. He used to write notes, like postcards. So yeah. I get a postcard from it every so often. He went to Austin, to my hometown, and called my parents to go get dinner. <laughs> to wow. Them. Wow. So, he was that kind of person. And, and so I just so happened, my friend Frank was still in school and he says, you know, you live in Atlanta now and you can fly to Boston for 99 bucks. So why don't you just fly up and, and stop in and, and, and visit with us? And he didn't tell me it was the minority recruitment weekend. So I go up there and I see, I see Frank, I see some of my old friends from my master's program stayed on, but there's this group of, 
you know, BIPOC scholars, you know, doctoral students who are just amazing. They're, they're interesting people. And you go to class with these people, you hang out with these people. I'm like, this is what it's like. Oh my God, I want to be in this. Yeah. And then I met with Dr. Willie and he said, you know, Rich, you are a fine scholar. You know, you were, you were one of the finest scholars I've ever worked with. And, you know, I'm working on a book project and I would love to work with you in that project. You did a, I did a paper for his class yeah. and it was a comparative paper looking at minority majority families. And what I asked to do was look at the experiences of, of a same sex couple, a, a gay couple and a lesbian couple who had kids. In the early 1990s, this is before we had marriage equality. So you had to kind of find, and I had a friend who was very active in the LGBTQ community in Boston and helped me find couples. And I did this comparison and I gave it to him and he was like, this is brilliant, it should be published. I thought he was just kind of blowing smoke, but you know, he was serious. And so he says, I would love for you to work on this book with me. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I live in Atlanta, so How's that's going to be kind of awkward. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, no, no, no. You, you apply for the doctoral program and we'll get you in the program and then we'll start writing the book. And my wife was with me and I was like, so he's, I should apply for graduate school again. Cause I was thinking I was going to do it at some point in my life, but not right now. Yeah. I literally just moved to Atlanta that the year before. And, and so my wife's working at CNN. We were do, everything was kind of just starting off for us, but I did have that kind of listlessness about, you know, this job's fine. I like the people I work with, but I don't really know if this is what I should be doing. So I applied very late in the process. I mean, probably a month of lead up, but it was festering in my mind. So I knew I had ideas and things I've been thinking about. And the thing I was thinking about is the connection, sense of belonging, mentoring for Black people in higher education and how it sort of can be very gappy. It can, it can, yeah. I was in environments where it were very, very uh, supportive and then there's environments where there was no presence. Yeah. And so mentoring came to mind as a, as a, as a, as a thesis. And of course, thinking about Bob Marley, you know, youth doing work, those kinds of things, wrote this essay, shipped it off and didn't, again, thought I would probably get in the first year. I might have to apply again, but that's okay. I'm happy here. I, I got a job. Told my boss at Emory and he was very dramatic. He says, well, if mother Harvard calls you back, Richard, you must go back. And, and so um, for basically from November until March, every day people were like, did you get into Harvard? Did you get into Harvard? I'm like, I don't, you'll know when I know. And once again, I got a phone call from Stacey Blakebeard, who's one of my professors who studied mentoring. And she said, Rich, you coming back to join us again? And I'm like, oh, am, am I in? You know, and she's like, yes. So that was the second time around. And so, Fantastic. yeah, we, we, we decamped to Boston again um, and, you know, started the whole problem. My wife, you know, to her great credit was like, this seems like the thing we should do. I know I'm just getting started in my career here, but we should, we should do this. This is pretty important. Um, I got there and started classes on September 11th, 2001. So, Ooh. yes, 9-11. And remember 9-11, the planes yeah. left Boston. Yes. So that entire first day uh, was incredibly, uh, people were in, people I had not known had friends in New York and people were trying to find out what happened. That evening, we had a memorial service at the Harvard Chapel. Yeah. And, and so that first year was quite intense because we were all dealing with all of the maelstrom of emotions that you have. Yeah. But my cohort, uh, doctoral cohort was predominantly students of color, predominantly women, and we just kind of came together very, uh, very quickly and mm -hmm. very much based on the idea. We were working in education in various levels. So some folks were in the policy space. Some people were working in either elementary or secondary, or working in as principals or superintendents of schools. And myself and one other uh, student, Stella Flores, who's my colleague today here at the University of Texas, mm -hmm. were the higher ed people. And, and of course, you know, higher ed is where we always talk about, you know, this is where you get students who are from different diverse backgrounds together. What do we do? And so my work in mentoring, the work I did with Dr. Willie on the Black Families book, and eventually uh, studying historically Black colleges and universities, and so by the time I finished my program, we had written three books together. Um, and, you know, that had been just an amazing experience to, to get to know Dr. Willie in that level, to be his co-author. And, and literally um, from that point on, we you know, I graduated in 2007 with my doctorate, came to University of Texas as a professor. We did our last book in 2010. Yeah. Um, and then we continued to sort of talk about mentoring and, and sort of, uh, the Black Experience in Higher Education together until 2012. Uh, Dr. Willie passed away earlier this year wow. and uh, at the age of 90, at 94. Wow, um, he had a good so, innings. 
he had he had good innings. He did, and he was brilliant. And so, uh, one of the most incredible things that happened is that I got to give his eulogize him in part at the uh, Harvard Memorial Chapel at his service. Yeah. And his wife and his family are like family to me. And yes. so I, I told them, I said, you know, I'm so nervous, but I got up there and started speaking from the scripture and I could hear Chuck, oh, that's my scholar there. Oh, he's <laughs> he's saying good things there. And, um, you know, did it. And, and yeah. this is a man who, um, you know, grew up in Texas in the 1940s, couldn't go to the University of Texas where I work because of segregation goes to Morehouse College in Atlanta. He's the youngest person in his class, along with Martin Luther King. Yeah. So they were buddies. They, yeah. they hung out. And, you know, that class, class of 48 from Morehouse, just became this amazing. So Martin Luther King, Dr. Willie, uh, Samuel Du Bois Cook, all these people who went out and did amazing things were in the same freshman class of like, I don't know, 50, 60 young men. And one thing I learned from Dr. Willie was just this, the importance of that experience. And Benjamin and Elijah Mays, who was the president of Morehouse, who they, they, had, they adored, they, they were so respectful of him and, and how he would, you know, drop knowledge on them. And, and so he was very much that for many of us. And so, of course, when he passed, generations of, of people were like, Dr. Willie was my mentor. And I was like, literally like the last one off the line. I was the last collaborator he had. So it was really uh, a special experience. But I, I always think about him as somebody who really taught me about the importance of being a scholar, the importance of developing a sense of belonging for students, because he told me I was a scholar. Yeah. I mean, wait, he kept on telling me that. I didn't believe him. I'm not a scholar. I'm this guy who barely got into the program. And he's like, no, you're a scholar. And uh, I guess he was right. <laughs> you know, like, Here he, I am. <laughs> he was positively reinforcing you. And, and empowering you to go up and beyond where you thought you could potentially even reach. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's what mentoring is about. It's about, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants because they can see the vista that you can't see. Mm. You can see what, you know, you, you know, you think you're barely getting by, but I have a comparative. He has a comparative, you know, lens. Yeah. He's like, I think you're actually on the top echelon. I think you can do yeah. these things. And mm. I have the same experience now with my students. When I have students who are just like, well, you know, I'm like, oh, you could do this and you could do it well, you know, so keep yeah. keep moving. And so a lot of what we do is just, you know, being that encourager. And even when students are, you know, having a growth mindset and saying, you know, you're here right now, but you can get up here. It could happen, you know, and, and sometimes you just need to be told that because a lot of times, you know, I think what happens for a lot of students, you know, if you've done well academically, you have a fixed mindset. You think you're just smart and then you encounter something that's hard which is supposed to happen. Yeah. And then you don't know what to do. Yeah. And when I remind people, it means that's the time when you need to think about, I yeah. can expand, I can learn. Yeah. Um, I had to learn that. It took me a long time to learn that too, because I thought I was smart. And then I found out I was not smart in one thing. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not smart at all. Mm -hmm. And you know, having a growth mindset kind of helped me think about the fact that actually I can be smart. If I work and I apply myself and do other things, I can get to that point. But um, I mentioned two Black uh, mentors, both of whom went to historically Black colleges and universities. And I think that's a really important part of it, too. Like, mm -hmm. the ethos of those institutions is about community uplift. Yeah, It's about doing more than teaching a class. It's about really being in the lives uh, of your students. And so yeah. I, I'd, I'd never, never um, sort of um, stop talking about the fact that I didn't attend the HBCU. Yeah. But I was mentored by people who did. So, so you, not how, how can I almost um, the words have lost me, but almost by distraction, you were although you didn't go to a HSBU, you actually did because those who mentored you had gone there, and that was the mindset that they were passing on to you. My very first academic article I wrote, Wayne, was being the grandchild of HBCU. That's why how I, I talked about it. You know, being mentored by HBCU graduates is another effect. Because one of the, the the Black College Mystique book we wrote in uh, two thousand and five, we wrote that book. Um, really was responding to a question. Now that we have integrated school settings, why do we have historically black colleges and universities? What's the point? You know, mm -hmm. you know, you can go to Southern or you can go to LSU. Why would you go to Southern? Because they have less resources, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. But of course, HBCUs have had an outsized impact on education in the black community, but mm -hmm. also leadership, right? Uh, so currently I work with students. I have a student went to Howard University. Kamala Harris, who's our first Black vice president, an Asian vice president, um, went to 
Howard. Tanashi Coates went to Howard, and so on and so forth, right? This school that allegedly is not the same level as a Michigan or a Texas is producing amazing leaders, right? So there is a mystique about that experience, and, and you're exactly right. Um, that was a really powerful uh, notion for me. Here in Austin, Texas, we are two miles from historically black college called Houston Tilton University. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've always been very interested and worked with colleagues there and taking my students into that space because a lot of people kind of think, well, HBCUs are places where black people go. Well, first of all, they're very diverse institutions. Uh, one of my very good friends who's um, Asian, you know, her, her family's from India. Her father taught at HBCU. Right. Why? Because a lot of research universities would not hire you know, uh, international faculty. Yeah. You'll, you'll see the most diverse faculties there. One story that's not up and told about HBCUs is that white faculty who work at HBCUs. And in fact, uh, the historian John Hope Franklin, who's, you know, probably the one of the most preeminent, preeminent Black historians in American history, mm-hmm. went to Fisk University in Nashville and mm-hmm. at HBCU. It was taught by a guy named Thomas Currier, who was a white man who uh, was his mentor and um, Hope Franklin was a brilliant scholar and he was offered a master's uh, fellowship at Harvard, but he couldn't afford it. And so Courier said like, we're not gonna make that be the barrier. And Courier sold his furniture to to support John Hope Franklin getting his degree at Harvard. Um, and, and I tell that story a lot because it's about cross-racial mentoring, but it's also about the HBCU ethos. Yeah, you know, a professor sold his furniture to send his student on, yeah. um, and, and so I, those kinds of stories really, uh, I thought, I found inspirational. And of course, what happened at the end of the beginning of the Second World War, where a lot of Jewish scholars were leaving Europe because of the impending sort of Nazi uh, regime, um, they would go and try to get employed by a Columbia or by a Harvard, and they would be told straight up, "We don't hire Jewish people; we have a quota." Um, but HBCUs would hire those people. Yeah. So you have these amazing stories of these German scholars, uh, Jewish scholars who moved to Alabama in 19, you know, 39 and taught at, you know, Tuskegee or taught at, you know, Rust College for, you know, 60 years. And they'll tell people, the students will tell you that professor, you know, was the most loving person I ever had in my life. And I never knew white people could be like that. And it's yeah. this white Jewish guy from Germany who made his life there. And you know, we often don't talk about this, but Einstein spent some time uh, working at HBCUs in the summers. He was that uh, devoted to that purpose. So it, those kinds of stories got me excited about the potential and possibilities in higher education. And that's, you know, I, I still to this day have a great debt and gratitude to HBCUs. And I often have to remind um, my my colleagues that let's not get high on our own supply and think that, oh, because we are a top whatever university that we can't learn from these smaller institutions that have smaller endowments, uh, often have fewer students, but their impact and their ability to build a sense of belonging is far superior to, to ours. Yeah. So we should be listening and we should be taking notes. So that, that's always been something I've always sort of done is like, why, why are we so interested in what Stanford and Harvard are doing when, you know, maybe Howard and Texas Southern and Prairie View and a are doing interesting things that we should be learning about? Yeah. I'm just wary of time because uh, I know it's early for you and you, you've got the rest of your day. In, but there's a couple of things which I still want us to explore, if you don't mind. And guys, if you've got questions, either put them in the chat or we'll give you a chance to um, open up the questions in a minute. <clears throat> I'm just thinking about all of that wealth of experience which you've had and how that has then how you've you're utilizing that in your current role. And I didn't I didn't really mention it before, but I'm gonna mention it now because I'm I'm just proud to be sat on on this platform with you. Um seriously as the, the vice provost for um curriculum and enrollment and the dean of the undergraduate and um, students undergraduate studies at the university of texas one how did you get that position what is it that you're going to do or you're trying to implement because i know you're just really new into the position but really new represent <laughs> <laughs> representation matters 
It does. It does. Well, I, I love that. Um, you know, and Wayne, I, I'm a month and a day into the job. So <laughs> I've been doing this for like exactly one month and I'm actually in the central tower of the university. So, I mean, symbolically, you know, the university of Texas has this tower and it's kind of like the center of campus. And we often say the tower to refer to the administration. I'm in the tower. So that yeah. conveys a lot. So, you know, the way it happened for me, you know, um, I, I came to academia as a scholar. I, I came to, you know, and I actually didn't think I would you know, hit the bar for tenure. I thought I would probably do this for a couple of years and then probably have to go find something else to do, but that was okay. I didn't mind. Just being a professor is a cool thing. Yeah. Um, but as you know, once you start the process and start doing the work and start publishing, you start to get invested in the process. You're like, well, I worked really hard. Mm -hmm. I think I have in fact, you know, cleared the bar for, for tenure and promotion. I was promoted, promoted in 2014 yeah. to associate professor, the mid rank. And then I started kind of moving into different directions. I was interested in still issues of equity and inclusion, but I was more interested in sort of the life cycle of faculty. And I knew this issue of cultural taxation where our faculty, because they're focused on supporting students of color are often taken away from doing research and other things like that. So that kind of became my wheelhouse. And I was writing about that and those kinds of things. And I actually realized at that point, I had tenure, like I had lifetime appointment at the university. So I could just focus on that. And I remember talking to one of my colleagues um, and my colleague, Bob Jensen is now retired from the university, but radical feminist, radical anti-racist, white guy from North Dakota who was just about it. He was a serious, serious dude. And he says to me, he's like, well, Rich, you know, what's next for you? I'm like, I don't know, man, but I worked really hard to get tenure. I'm kind of like, this is a recurring thing with me. I'm like, okay, I've, I've arrived. I'm going to do other things. And he said to me, he said, you know, I got to challenge you on that because, you know, all your concerns about the structures of higher education and equity, you can't make those changes unless you are at the highest level of the university. Mm -hmm. um, you need to become a full professor. You need to get to the highest rank you can get. And I was like, well, that's your opinion, you know? <laughs> so, but nevertheless, I, again, I'm working on projects and I'm doing work and I am going through a process. And I am hitting my stride. So, I'm continuing to do my work. I've been involved in lots of things. I'm starting to get a national reputation for my work in mentoring. And so people are asking me to come give lectures in other places. And when they're giving you, uh, I didn't know this, Wayne, but when they invite you to give a lecture, they're actually trying to check you out and see, you know, maybe you might want to come work at Vanderbilt or Indiana, you know. And sometimes it's explicitly done and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's like, just come talk and give a talk and they're just taking notes and they, you know, we have a position opening up next year. So that happened a few times, but I was never really serious about pursuing I my family is here in Austin and we like it here um but it was time for promote it was we had a new dean in my college college of education Charles Martinez and Charles had been the diversity officer for the University of Oregon mm -hmm. and he said you know this college needs a diversity officer and I was on a committee to actually recommend that we have a diversity officer, administrator at the highest level at the, at the college to focus on what was happening with diversity and equity, you know, hiring, climate, those kinds of things. Yeah. And so Charles announced this and I was like, kind of interested in that, you know? And so I applied for that position, went through about, I don't know, three months of interviews. And then finally I was appointed in April, 2019 to that role. Yeah. And I was an associate professor and I was really concerned. I thought I was not being the running because I wasn't the full professor. Yeah. But we sat down. He says, I really think that you are on track to make it to the full professor. So that's why I hired you. Yeah. So I went up for promotion that very next year in the, on this new job, I was promoted to full professor. And so I was doing this administrative job, working in the College of Education, looking very really intently about our equity uh, commitments, especially when it came to hiring. You know, mm -hmm. I had a role to make sure we hired people yeah. um, in diverse backgrounds and shape a lot of that process. Um, then I got a call and said, hey, you know, we've consolidated our, you know, enrollment management functions, our admissions, our registrar, our, you know, financial aid office, and the undergraduate studies mechanism, which has student support. So you should apply for that. And I'm like, I don't think so. That sounds like a lot of work. I don't know. I'm, I'm good where I am. Um, talked to my wife and some other people and they're like you know I think you actually would be a person who could be good at this so at least explore it so I did I went and did the interview replied um and the more I interviewed about what we do in my shop which is basically shaping the entire undergraduate experience from the moment the students first inter interact with the university from recruitment to admissions to make sure they have financial aid to make sure that they 
all those things happen to what happens when they get here. Do they have support as far as academics help and stuff like that to career engagement? Yeah. I'm like, that's an amazing role, and especially for somebody like me who's first generation and somebody like me who struggled at the university to have that role. And so I went through that process and I was appointed in, I guess it was March and I had a gradual sort of ramp up. So I had percentage parts where I was doing things in undergraduate studies and enrollment management and in the College of Education. And I officially came under this role 100% on August 1st. So literally, I am a month and a day into the job. And it is a lot, but it is really, it, it's humbling to think what we can actually do. Um, we have the ability to really impact student experiences. And I'll tell you something about the University of Texas. We talked about this yesterday. Um, I have a deanship and a senior vice provostship. Those are two of the highest academic yeah. ranks at the university. And the only person who has the same role as I do is Mark Smith, who is the uh, senior vice provost and dean of, uh, of graduate studies. And we're both black men. And I don't know what chemistry happened in the world to make that happen, but the people in charge of the undergraduate and the graduate experience are, are African-American males. And I think it's pretty remarkable. So nice. just getting started, but this is really exciting for us. You know, what, I just I, I'm I'm going to be watching. I'm hoping to integrate with you in 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 some ways because I think it's absolutely brilliant um, that you're in that position. I know you're new to it, but you've got a vision as to where you want it to go, and that's yeah. the that's the important thing. And so we need to support each other on this journey. I've yes. just noticed that Donald, um, a good hey, it's Donald. <laughs> Donald. What's going on, Donald? <laughs> All right. Do you want to ask your question, Donald? Are you in a position to ask your question? You're not walking this time. You're sitting down, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just, again, I just want to, what I've just said, absolutely brilliant and so in, inspirational, Prof. Uh, I, 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 as my dearest friend Wayne says, this, this has just been fantastic. Uh, uh, but I know time is short, so... When I see you in person, I'll give you more accolades. But I literally came across a study just by accident. And I put it in the chat and it literally for others to, to have a look at it um, from, um, I think her name's Alison Morgan, based in the US. Yeah. And she's done a study where she's looked at a, um, the um, type of, of professors across many US universities. And in fact, what she says is that um, there is a limited uh, uh, in diversity. She found that a significant proportion of professors, their parents, are either one or other has got a PhD, they come from an academic background, it's, uh, it's twice as high from prestigious universities. And her conclusion is this select group are completely disproportionate to, to, to practically <laughs> not just the student body, but to other areas of university. And it, it's, so sure. the question then is for you is, you've managed to break that. <laughs> and, yeah. And so get one of your thoughts about that. And then what can we do to increase that? Um, yeah. And it's just, uh, she makes this, what she seemed incredibly surprised by, but it's, I won't use her terms, but she did say that was an incredible privileged group of individuals. And I put the link, if anyone else wants to have a look at that paper that literally just came out this week. In Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be looking, I'm looking at the charts right now. Donald, I mean, this that's, so anecdotally, you know, when I was at Harvard, I remember, um, I remember being in a statistics class and there was a, a woman in the class who used to knit in class. I, I kid you not, with like knitting needles, clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack. I'm like, that's very annoying and very entitled. Like, you should probably be listening to the class. And somebody said, well, you know, her dad is, you know, Professor so and so. I'm like, well, I don't know who that is. I'm like, well, that's an important person. But at, at some point, I started realizing that my classmates often, who were pursuit of academic jobs had family members who were in the business. And, you know, I think about the work of Richard Reeves, uh, who's another Brit actually who writes in America about social mobility, he wrote the book, The Dream Hoarders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are the ways that people in the top quintile sort of hoard opportunity and limit access for other folks, right? So we have top of the 1%. 
he's like the top 20% actually are the ones who provide access to internships and exposure. Because since I've been 18 years old, my family is completely confused about what I'm doing. Like, okay, we know you go to class and you have exams, but then you, what do you, and, and my mom never understood the doctorate thing. Like she said, you like to write. So write that paper and get it done. It's long paper. You write a lot. That's not a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So every step of the way is confounding. And quite frankly, um, it really helps. And I told you about Dr. Willie. There's other people like Dean Whitla and people like Susan Moore Johnson and Tom Hare, all these other professors, mentors I had who really unpacked the job for me. This is what the job entails. Mm -hmm. So most of most students, we ask students what professors do. I do a lot of instructing and, 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 and enlightening to my students because they think like we're like high school teachers. We teach a class and we go, well, we have to publish actually, mm -hmm. and we have to do research. And the research and the publishing we do is actually really interesting stuff. And some of us do that almost more than we do teaching, right? And so a lot of times it's just getting hooked into that possibility. So having people being very explicit about what the job is, but the thing that was really important for me is that people told me about the positive things about being an academic, because there's, as we know, there are tons of things that maybe you don't want to, you know, watch out. This is a problem, but it's a position that really affords you opportunity to pursue your interests. Mm -hmm. I have very few, well, I'm an administrator now, but when I was a faculty member, very few constraints on what I wanted to do, what I wanted to teach, what I wanted to be, where, you know, if I get the money to go and fund myself to go to Antarctica and do research, I could do that. Um, the multiple flexibilities we have as scholars, and I, I talked to a professor, uh, Tommy Shelby, who's a um, philosophy professor at Harvard, and he talked about the life of the mind. And Tommy is such a scholar. He's got the little glasses and the tweed jacket with the patches, <laughs> the life of the mind. And I'm like, that sounds so cool. I mean, that sounds like I want to have the life of the mind, you know? And um, when I was in graduate school, I did realize, look, somebody actually is, is funding me to think about things. Somebody actually wants me to think through problems. Mm. That's a hell of a conceit. I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, I'm, I'm that worthy. So I've, I've always loved what this job's about. On the other hand, Donald, I've never been so infatuated with, I can't see the absurdity of what happens in academia. Um, one of the benefits of having a family that has not been to college is I can tell them things like, well, that's just stupid. Why do they have that? I'm like, you're right. It is stupid. I don't know why they have that. I don't know why we wear our getups, you know, every year in our fancy hats it's a little it's a little you know it's a little over the top but um you know i do think there's a social um printing that happens and the solution to that in my opinion is to make sure that we our job is to recognize talent right it's to recognize people and sometimes talent is not the person with the highest grades it's the person with the most passion it's the person with the most you know interesting questions right and say to them you should really think about this. And I think about through my career, how I'll tell us one quick story. I had a professor, I took a class on hip hop in 1993, which is like the dawn. I'm like, there's a class on hip hop. And the gentleman who taught me, his name was, was Kermit, Kermit Campbell. And um, I took the class with him and I, I enjoyed the class. I did well in the class. And I just thought to myself, you know, that's the first time I saw like a, like I had George Wright as a professor. George Wright was this, my parents' age, right? So he was an older person and a wonderful person, but nobody really close to my proximity. But here's Kermit Campbell teaching about hip hop, something I care about, uh, and he's a professor. And so when I got tenure, um, I was writing a piece called uh, Reclaiming My Time, basically talking about my journey through academia. I had tenure now, I could do this. And I said, you know, that's the first time I saw a youngish black male in the front of a classroom as a professor. And I wanted, he imprinted something upon me. He never told me and sat down to me and said, you should be a professor, but something clicked with me. So I said, I'm going to send him a note and let him know this happens. So I started writing an email and I'm like, mm, email is, I'm going to call his office, leave him a voicemail for him. Call his office, leave a voicemail for him. Um, he picks up and I said, is this Dr. Campbell? He's like, it is Dr. Campbell. Who is this? I said, this is Rich Reddick. And, you know, I was a student of yours at University of Texas in 1993. And he's like, Rich Reddick. Oh, Rich. Oh, my gosh, Rich. What are you doing right now? How are you doing? I was like, um, I'm a professor at UT. I'm an associate professor at UT Austin. And he just, like, silence. And he just said, brother, I'm so proud of you, right? Like, and I said, you didn't, you didn't do anything. You didn't say anything to me. But seeing you, this is what you said earlier, Wayne, 
representation matters, right? Yeah. You put something in my mind that said it was possible for me to do this and it was subconscious, but it popped up and you need to know that. And I've had the benefit, of course, of having that experience, uh, you know, for students I work with here. But I mean, we need to have our, we need to be visibly in those spaces because that's, that's why people get inspired. Yeah. And they see you struggling with it. They see you excelling in it. And they're like, well, I could probably do that. Or, or it looks interesting. I might try that out. And, and so that's what our job is to do. I mean, uh, one of my biggest mentors in the world is a woman named Juliet Garcia. She was the first Mexican-American Latina college president in the United States. And she was asking people like, what do I do as a president? What's the job about? And one of the uh, people she talked to said, your job is to defend democracy. Your job is to you know, inspire people and support people so they can make sure that this democracy functions, right? And in this particular time and vantage point in history, that's never been more important. Yeah. So whether your work is in the sciences or in the humanities or in you know creative arts, we need to be inspiring people to to embrace and support democracy, and that's that's what I've just tried to do. Tried. I don't know if I've done it well, but I've definitely tried to do it. Thank you, guys. I am just wary of the time. All right, um, Richard, I'm going to ask you one final question. We'll take the rest of it offline. So sorry, guys, if yes. you're going to stop recording. But this final question, what advice would you have given to your 16-year-old, 17-year-old <laughs> self about the potential, about where you would end up? What advice would you have given them? Oh, wow. Well, um, I was like, you know, get it together, man. Like, you know, get organized, you know, do better, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things. But... I think what I would say, that's actually a really great question. Uh, actually, it was a lecture yesterday and a professor did a letter to herself when she was younger. Yeah. I think I would say is know that, know that your experiences, what you're going through is going to pay off. Like the stuff that's hard, the stuff that's really testing you, it's for a purpose, right? Um, and, and reflect on those things and, and know that, you know, there are things ahead of you that you can't even imagine uh and get ready for it i mean because i think if anything sometimes i think about the accidental nature of what happened but i also think about the fact that you know you have to be prepared for opportunities when opportunities present themselves you have to be ready um when somebody asks you can you do this would you be interested in doing this you have to respond affirmatively or you have to at least demonstrate that you have the capacity or interest and a lot of times it's just curiosity i'm like I have no idea what a vice provost does. Okay. And, and, and think about this also in a sense that uh, proportionality and understanding um, balance. I mean, I struggle with that to this day. I get in the most trouble in my life when I don't do balance, when I'm unbalanced, you know, when I'm doing too much work and enough family stuff. It's never been the other way around. It's always that way. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing I would say to myself is like, you know, make sure you take the time to really uh, embrace. And, and I'm at the point where I've lost some of my mentors. I've lost some people I care about. And I value the time I have with those people. And if anything, I have regrets that I wish I had more time or I wish I had spent more. And that's what's important. Uh, just making sure that we understand that we only get one life and live it well. Um, I'm thinking about when we heard Sir Jeff at, one, at, the, at another belonging event, yeah. just hearing him talk about his life mattered, yeah. you know, like the, the accomplishments in the lab are important. You're, you're, you've been knighted. That's, that's huge. But, you know, just hearing you talk about how you journeyed, how you survived, how you triumphed, those stories matter. So just know those stories are important and the struggle is important. You'll come through the struggle. You'll be better because of it. It might hurt in the moment, but it'll be beneficial in the end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just stay grounded and connected. I think that's the most important thing. Every time things go off track for me, it's because I'm not grounded. You know, mm -hmm. I started buying the hype, you know, mm -hmm. I, I started stop listening to people who are important. And then it's like, oh, OK, no, I, I mean, I'll do this thing when I'll call. I have a, 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 a council of mentors and they're most they're not all black, but they're mostly black people and many are black women. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, am I tripping? Am I? And they're like, yeah, you kind of are, you know, in this space or <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, actually you're doing great in that space. And that validates me. The, the times where I've been most challenged, I'll call those people up and I'll like, you know, what do you think? They're like, nah, you're good. You're good. You know, keep on doing. And we're proud of you. 
that that inspires me. So I, I feel very fortunate to have my family near me. Um, they've been able to share in all the things that happen. And frankly, it's it's kind of fun to watch my parents like, oh, he's so smart. I'm like, that's not what they really like. They were fussing, they were fussing at me all the time and telling me I didn't get my stuff together and get organized. Oh, we didn't, we never had to worry about him. I'm like, no, no that's not true. Anyway, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's fun. And, all, and you know, I think also being a being a parent, and you know, we have that in common to have being a parents, you know, I think thinking about how I can help my kids because Richard Reeves talks about this idea of the intergenerational transfer of wealth. And it's not just financial wealth, but it's also wealth in the sense of, you know educational um, opportunity, you know, what can I do to take down barriers for my kids and their kids behind them? Because as one of my colleagues says, if you're a first generation college student, you're the last first generation college student in your family. That's right. Because from this point on, your family will say, you know, like your cousin, like your brother, like whomever, you will do this kind of thing. You'll make it real for people. So, you know, it, it, yeah, that's definitely what I'd say. But it, it's it's been a hell of a journey. I'm st I'm still having fun in doing this, mm -hmm. um, for the most part. Not every not everything's fun, but most of it is. <laughs> Listen, as far as I'm concerned, you are to be congratulated. You you are a beacon for us. I'm so I'm so happy by serendipity. It seems that we met and we've been able yes. to have these conversations because it's a conversation which I truly do believe. Um, is a value to our community, whether the community is in America, whether the community is here in the UK, if people are listening in the West Indies, wherever we are, this is a very valuable representation of black excellence. And, and I, I want to applaud that. So I just want to say a really big thank you. Well, thank you, brother. And like you said, serendipity, fate, whatever, I, I feel very blessed and lucky to run to you and Donald and the folks I met at Imperial College. We, we are returning. We're going to be back. Uh, my, my group I came with in the summer of uh, this past year, uh, we'll be back in the UK in the first week in January. And, and Wayne and I are talking about trying to do something where we can talk about the work we've been doing and really foster this transatlantic uh, connection that we have because we're dealing with the same challenges uh you know it, it's it's not something that should be contained into an institution or even a nation these are global issues about the presence of uh black and asian and and, and other folks of color a representation in the in, in academia so i'm looking forward to this just being the first of many conversations we have um shout out to everybody in the uk i hope that you're all having great times there i miss being there i want to get back there and you know have a cheeky nandos and just you know have a good time with everybody so anyway um this has been great thank you so much thank for you. Uh, the time i'm gonna just advertise what we've got on but another really big thank you for next um week and next week let me just put the share on um next week we're going to have another guest and our guest next week is Miss Samantha Tross and she is the first black um, consultant, first black female um, consultant um, orthopedic surgeon and she's going to be telling us her story next week. So I want to just um, invite you all to attend that next week and if you haven't had an opportunity to see um, some of the other interviews that we've got, including this one, please go to our YouTube channel and you'll find them at um, tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO. And the other guests which we've had, you can have a listen to them. And just finally, there's a, another brief where you can have a look at our first 100 guests and have a little profile of some really good ones. And just want to say a big thank you to everyone who has contributed to the belonging so far. It's wonderful that we're able to have so many people who have shared their story. So until next time, take care, and I will see you very, very soon. Thanks, everybody. This was great. Really enjoyed this. Thank you. Oh, just one minute.